Right. Um, I'll start. I, I, I will mention some names and I will um, give you the spelling after in some of the subsequent uh, um, uh, slides. So, <clears throat> repression following the surrender of the city of Mo uh, in May 1422 has been interpreted as just another act uh, of cruelty adding up to the hefty record of Henry V. And we, we have had the lecture of uh, Sean Maglin who showed how the historiography has uh, condemned Henry V for the slaughter of the prisoners of Agincourt, the later historiography. A recent study by a French historian, which is focused on one particular individual during the siege, the Batard de Vorus, or the uh, Bastard of Vorus, and we don't know exactly where he comes from and who he is. We have just a bit of element about his record of service. Uh, I'll show you the spelling of his name after. So, focus on this uh, Batard Vorus, who was the alleged commander of the city during the siege, further darkens this portrait of the English king. Vorus, following this study, was executed in the most ignominious manner because of his hero heroic resistance he and his acolytes had put up against Henry V. Such an execution, on the account of resistance, is regarded in this study as unfair. This would be the reason why some chroniclers who supported the Anglo-Burgundian regime in France depicted Vorus as a bloodthirsty a thirsty monster. It was a way, indeed, to discredit the commander of Meaux, to steal from him his entitlement to fight and resist and to justify his otherwise unjustifiable execution. In other words, Henry V was entitled to kill him as a monster, a despicable murderer, but not as a resistant. <clears throat> Vorus in this study is presented as a fierce fighter who is uh, the kind of a victim of a conspiracy. He is a scapegoat. The English king comes out from this study as not only cruel, but also deceitful and underhand. Curiously, this argument turns out to be in line with the propagandistic discourse of the most fervent supporter of the French monarchy, the Norman chronicler Robert Blondel. On the contrary, I will argue <coughs> that Henry V used the surrender of Meaux to make an important political and ethical stance which drew its strength from its legal foundation and gives an acute insight into his sense of honor and justice. I will show in the first part of this paper that there was no perceived heroism in the resistance of the besieged who paid the full price of a breach of the Code of Honor. In the second part, I will address the fate of two defenders tried and executed as rebels in Paris. This was a honor from which Voris was stripped, but why? In the final part, I will examine the degradation and execution of a nobleman. So, honor and heroism. The siege of Meaux lasted all in all around seven months. It was the longest resistance that the French placed opposed to Henry V. The town itself fell after five months when the defenders took refuge in the market. Burgundian chroniclers, in particular, highlighted the strong resilience of the occupants of the market, who resisted another two months. The latter ignored a summons of Henry V to surrender, according to them, and withstood a remarkable assault of the besiegers, which lasted seven to eight hours, the defenders being reduced to use iron turnspits as lances, for all their lances were broken. So here... Uh, I was uh, quite surprised to see how uh, a market, a fortified market, uh, could resist two months against Henry V's army until I realized when I came to Mo that the market is not uh, a building but a whole area uh, of, of, of Mo, which was described, uh, recently been studied by a, a French historian who described the city as a two-headed administration. So you have, uh, it's obviously a 20th century, sorry, for, for the, the postcard from 20th century, uh, this was the center 
uh, uh, called the town of Mo, and this was the market which was fortified and surrounded by the Marne, so uh, quite well protected. And yes, Mo, you can see, is on the uh, north e but more east and northeast of. Uh, it's, it's a bit smaller than that. Um, <laughs> so. Even if this assault did not mark the end of the siege, this deed of arms symbolizes, so the long assault I just talked about, this deed of arms symbolizes the choice of the garrison to fight to the last of their abilities until they could no more. The desperate situation to which the obstinacy of the besieged had led them when the time eventually came to negotiate a surrender is well evidenced. Some occupants of the markets later on in October 1425 in a letter of remission described the capture of the market as primarily a deed of arms as if the place had been stormed and not surrendered through a negotiation. Jean de Merly, uh, an esquire among the defenders of the market and a surprisingly lucky recipient of a pardon in June 1422, introduces the idea of a choice in the hands of Henry V, who condescended to make a treaty with the besieged. If he chose this option rather than launching a final assault, it was to have the besieged I quote, better at his mercy, the besieged, better at his mercy, and to take more profit from them, according to the chronicler Pierre de Fénin, who implies that in the English king was unwilling to share the booty and the prisoners with his own soldiers. Finally, finally, the paradoxical idea of a treaty of unconditional surrender strikingly emerges from the preamble of the agreement, which in a rather unique fashion ignores the part played by the negotiations, emphasizing instead the pleasure and will of Henry V, heir, heir and regent of the Kingdom of France, and Charles VI, whom he represented. So the terms of surrender of the market were particularly severe. In short, all properties and movables in the market were confiscated. The occupants of the market, <coughs> combatants and non-combatants alike, had their lives spared but remained prisoners. And we know that about 150 of them were sent to England and dispatched to various fortresses. They had to pay an individual ransom to regain their freedom and to obtain a letter of pardon from the king if they wanted to come back and live under the obedience of the English, of, of uh, the, the Peace of Troyes so the, in Lancastrian France. Twelve named individuals together with the gunners, the perjurers, and anyone who had been involved in the murder of John the Fearless were accepted from this treaty, accepted from the grace of the king. Uh, so I will talk now a bit about, uh, I will move from different chroniclers uh, uh, to talk about how uh, the long resistance was perceived uh, by the contemporaries. So th these are some of the accounts, uh, chroniclers who give an account of Mo who are relatively uh, extended. So how was this long uh, resistance and the following repression perceived by contemporaries? The answer to be searched in the chronicles is not straightforward and requires some uh, uh, precaution. Both the political persuasion, persuasion of the different authors and the date of their writing need to be taken into consideration, which, and these elements are not always known or clear-cut. More problematically, perhaps, there is a certain reluctance or disinterest from the authors to provide any explanation. Their account often remains descriptive and needs to be closely scrutinized. So let us start with one clear misconstru misconstruction. Uh, uh, there is no heroism or it comes later. Uh, up until the 1450s, the Batard de Vorus um, is presented by both the supporters and the detractors of Henry V and the anglo burgundian regime as a criminal. The concept of heroism, which focused on his person, uh, the person of the Batard de Vorus, belongs to a tradition emerging in the 1450s under the pen of Robert Blondel and Jean Juvenal des Ursins. 
the army of Charles VII then was proceeding to the systematic reconquest of the French territories which remained in English hands. The French government worked uh, hard on legitimizing the authority of Charles VII and fostering loyalty toward him among his new subjects. These political issues had a strong influence on the writing or rewriting of Blondel and Juvenal des Ursins. More contemporary criticism raised by the detractors of Henry V merely denounced his cruelty, which, according to the monk of Saint-Denis, extended to his own men. Henry would have in inhumanly tortured and buried alive one of his soldiers who attempted to flee during an encounter with the besieged. But it is important to know that these more contemporary sources, as I said, unreservedly condemned the crimes of the Batard de Vorus. Most of the chroniclers who provide a relative detailed account of the siege point to two factors which angered Henry V. Firstly, the insulting behavior um, uh, of the besieged. And uh, many of these accounts uh, uh, dwells upon uh, a joke, an offensive joke uh, made by the besieged. Uh, they, they would have put uh, a, don a crowned donkey on the walls and beat, uh, beat the donkey so that he brays. And uh, mm -hmm. they call on the shout to the English that they should rescue their king. Um, <laughs> Uh, and secondly, uh, the chroniclers also reported the killing by a projectile of the son of John Cornwall, who also happened to be a first cousin of the English king, as has been mentioned by uh, David Cleverly uh, on Friday. So Henry V exerted reprisals against those responsible for these particular offences, but these remained to my mind, irritating factors. They do not provide an overall explanation for the repression exerted by the English king. We need to scratch further the surface. Burgundian accounts also hint to at an underlying issue of honor. The anonymous author of the Chronique des Cordeliers, uh, a supporter of the Anglo-Burgundian regime, elaborates on the abusive behavior of the besieged the occupants of the market, according to him, because they thought that they would be rescued by a relieving force, held the town and market of Meaux for a very long time, despising and neglecting Henry V in many different manners, as if they did not take him into account nor all his power. So the chronicler blames the defenders for ignoring uh, the power, but mainly the stature of their opponent. In his eyes, the resistance was no heroism, but a breach of the code of Hannah. Enguerrand de Monstrelet finished his chronicle in 1447 after the collapse of the Anglo-Burgundian regime and the rapprochement of his master, the Duke of Burgundy, with Charles VII, but just before the French reconquest of Normandy and Aquitaine. Burgundy position was then neutral, and so is the general tone of Monstrelet's chronicle. Quite descriptive, but very detailed account. Some of these details only become significant in the light of a later commentator, George, uh, Georges Chastelin, who expanded on Monstrelet's account. Chastelin was writing his own account in the 1460s, after the reconquest, in the aim to celebrate the Duke uh, of Burgundy, uh, Philippe de Good. It's interesting to note that Chastelin does not judge Henry V very kindly. Nevertheless, for him, the blame for the repression was to be placed upon the defenders. Two episodes deserve our attention. Monstrelet mentions that the besieged ignored the, surrender, the summons to surrender. Chastelin highlights how imprudent this was, for, I quote, to surrender a place well defended when summoned by a prince guarantees misericorde or mercy to the surrendering party. Whereas, the capture by force of arms inevitably led to the death or the pride of the defenders. More revealingly, according to Monstrelet, the besieged appealed on several occasions to Guy uh, IV uh, de Nel, Lord of Ophémont, for him to become and comfort them and to become their captain. <coughs> So why would they need a captain since they already have a captain? This seems rather strange. 
Uh, and Chastelin uh, gives an insight into that. Firstly, he underlines the reciprocity of the inclination of both the besieged and the Lord of Ophemont, a noble knight issued from a great house, for the latter to become their captain. And a little further in his account, uh, claimed that truthfully, the besieged did not have any suitable commander with them to withstand the siege of such a powerful prince. The Batard de Vorus, nor anyone in the place, according to Chastelin, was deemed suitable enough or noble enough to resist the will of a king. The resistance following these authors was judged by Henry V as an affront to his honor. From an anthropological perspective, however valiant uh, uh, Juvenal des Ursins and Blondel wanted Vorus to be, he would never be as valiant as a king. Believing that he would, would inevitably be perceived as an insult to the honor of the king, a breach in the order of precedence. The occupants of the markets failed on that level. They may have realized at some point the limits of their social conditions, calling on Ophemont, a member of the higher nobility, but ultimately failed to take the full measure of it. They were too little of too humble origins to oppose such a resistance of a king to a king, or such was the contemporary views on this matter. There was no heroism for this author. Their resistance was a breach of a code of honor. I'm repeating myself. Um, Maurice Keane observed elsewhere the significance of the status of the combatants involved in siege warfare, and uh, especially in the situation of, of siege de prince, uh, a siege in which you have a king which is present, which for him has become a, a, a technical term at the time. Uh, so you, you, you respect, you need to respect the, the king. Yet the king has still the choice to show mercy, but he preferred on this occasion to exert the, the rigor of justice, which earned him the etiquette of cruel. So, <clears throat> chastising the rebels. Henry V was prepared to spare the life of the majority of the people of Mo, but some had to pay for the affront. He left no opportunity to, to the besieged to redeem their fault through a ritual of humiliation, as was the case in Calais, for example, in 3046, or in Harfleur. In order to avoid the effusion of blood, a relatively large group of individuals, 12 of whom were named, were to be handed over at the king's will and ordinance, or in other, in other words, at his mercy, as explicitly stipulated in the clause two of the treaty. From a legal perspective, the treaty, which like uh, any other contractual agreement, had force of law and entitled the king to dispose freely of their lives. He could order their summary execution with no accountability whatsoever. We know, for instance, that an example was made of one Horace, who blew up a horn during the siege, who paid with his life the episode of the donkey and all the insults uttered against the king during the siege, or a particular targeted retribution. Similarly, the gunners, held responsible for the death of the only son of John Cornwall and first cousin of Henry V, were apparently executed on the latter's behest. These executions raised no criticism. In fact, they practically went unnoticed in the sources. Clause fifth of the treaty made conditional the survival of five of the named individuals. These would have their lives spared <coughs> once any place under their direct command or that uh, of someone in their close entourage was surrendered to Henry V. Such a strategic exploitation uh, of the prisoners in a treaty of surrender is remarkable, but it is of minor importance in comparison with the fate reserved to another four named individuals. Oh. Um. Okay. So this is the clause four of the treaty. Uh, this clause for uh, the four individuals, Louis Gast, uh, the Batard de Vorus, Denis de Vorus, and Master Jean de Rouvre. Clause four of the treaty, as you can see there, anticipated that these men would be delivered to justice for justice to be done to them. This wasn't seen. 
Henry V could have disposed of their life at his own discretion, but he preferred them to face a court trial. The purpose of this decision was obviously political. So who were these individuals and what charges were held against them? This is not an easy question. Um, information on these four individuals needs to be searched outside the treaty, which says very little on them. Gast, uh, a knight, and Rouve, a doctor in law, were royal officials. They respectively held the office of Bailly and Prévost of Meaux. Since the abolition of the Commune of Meaux following the revolt uh, of 1358, the town, which no longer enjoyed any mayor or town council, had been placed under the command of these two royal officers, the Bailly and the Prévost. They were the responsible. In times of war, the power of the captain increased. And indeed, the constitution of a war council emerged from an order to demolish houses in March 1421. The order was issued by the Bailly and the captain of Meaux by council and advice of the other captains and men at arms garrisoned in the town and market. Vorus is designated by several chroniclers, but not all of them, as the general captain of the place. It might be the case that he was in command of the market only. Denis de Vorus, a relative of the Batar, either his brother or his cousin, appears in the chronicles as his lieutenant. So we can reasonably assume that in the eyes of Henry V, these four individuals represented the authority in the market. These four individuals were uh, those held responsible for the protracted resistance. So the paucity uh, of the records regarding the trial and condemnation of Gaston Rouvre have led some to, to uh, some confusion. Alain de Murger believed that they were tried for their complicity in the murder of John the Fearless in 1419 as was the case for several prisoners of Melun, uh, who uh, were tried in the beginning of 1421. Uh, it is not what the surviving uh, evidence suggests. Uh, it is based on no evidence. Gast and Rouvre were sent to Paris. The responsibility of their prosecution was given to the Prévost of Paris, uh, who had the responsibility to try criminal cases and prosecute treason since uh, 1359. His court had jurisdiction over the whole kingdom of France. The two men were found guilty as charged and sentenced to be beheaded in the Halle of Paris. But what were these charges? The registers of the criminal cases brought before the Parliament of Paris kept a record of an appeal against this sentence on a technical ground. They argued that they were clerics and should be tried by the church. Not surprisingly, this appeal was rejected and their beheading as prescribed by the Prévost took place publicly on the 25th of May. So quite swift, the whole procedure. A letter of grant regarding the redistribution of the properties of Jean de Rouvre indicates that the latter was convicted of a crime of lese majesty. Two chroniclers elaborate on that point. Thomas L. Mam, who defended the right of Henry V, describes the two men as ferocious enemies of the res publica, the common good, the most serious crime of all. The bourgeois de Paris, who we should say here was not a bourgeois, but a cleric and a likely canon of Notre Dame of Paris, and therefore a close and reliable witness, mentioned in an entry of his journal that the two men were executed as two of the captains of the rebellions. So, since Edward III assumed the title of King of France in 1340, the Anglo-French conflict could be seen as a civil war between two rival claimants uh, to the throne of France, as you well know. Um, so in theory, therefore, each and every French subject who opposed the English king could be considered by the latter as rebels. The Treaty of Troyes, sealed in May 1420 between Charles VI, Henry V, and the Duke of Burgundy, legally sanctioned this perspective by designating Henry V the English king uh, uh, and heir, um, the English king and his heir and his heirs as rightful successor of the French king Charles VI. The Treaty of Troyes very explicitly qualified as rebellious and disobedient any city, town, village, castle, and person who supported the cause of the Dauphin Charles, future Charles VII. It was the duty of Henry V acting as regent during the life of Charles VI to subdue these rebels and to restore peace in the kingdom. 
a letter of Charles VI elaborate, uh, issued the very same day, elaborate uh, on this clause, and in essence uh, uh, say that uh, anyone, any vassal or subject of the French king who slandered or hindered the peace of Troyes would be held as a criminal of least majesty and should be uh, uh, punished very rigorously. So Henry decided to apply this law of rebellion to these two surrendering individuals. In ordering this trial and securing the support of the Châtelet and the Parliament of Paris, which pronounced and confirmed the death sentence, Henry V made a splendid demonstration of his legitimate authority as regent and successor of the French crown and sent a strong signal to his enemies. So now I move on to the uh, Batard de Vorus, we, who knew at the end uh, another fate. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's still, I'm still thinking a bit uh, about you know, trying to organize, uh, to, to, to really crack this case. But, uh, here, so I will go on then, uh, just with uh, where I am now. So Henry V, uh, as we can see, had nothing to hide. He was entitled and prepared to punish rebellion in the shape of resistance as severely as the law allowed him to do. He could have handed over Vorus to the Prévost of Paris, who would have tried him along with Gast and Rouvre as rebel and criminal of Lee's majesty, but he chose not to do it. He did not need to make Vorus look like a criminal uh, uh, to, justify it, uh, to, to justify his execution. This is quite an important element. So Vorus was handed over to the English on the 2nd of May, on the signing of the Treaty of Surrender. According to the Bourgeois de Paris, he had already been executed three days later on the 5th of May, five days before the evacuation of the market. The punishment administered to Vorus gave rise to a grand spectacle. He was possibly dragged through the streets of Meaux before he was brought to an elm outside the city where the execution took place. The exact circumstances of it varies a little from one account to another, but there is a general consensus around the fact that his head was cut off and stuck to a lance, which was firmly attached at the top of the tree uh, while his body was suspended to a branch of it. So let's have a, a, a brief look at the symbolism of this execution. So um, uh, the uh, crime in Lancastrian Normandy has shown how uh, 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 show a picture of uh, the justice which was uh, very rational. Uh, I think uh, more recent studies have shown that uh, it's probably less the case. So studies of crime and society in late medieval France have revealed an approach to punishment which was less rational and systematic than has been previously acknowledged. For instance, all traitors were not necessarily beheaded, and conversely, all those beheaded were not necessarily traitors. They could be just nobles. Um, death sentences were relatively rare. They concerned hardened criminals. They were public, individual, and passionate. What mattered was not the rationality of the punishment, but the effect it had upon the rest of the society. And this remark most certainly applies to the case of Vorus. Place and timing of the execution were key elements. Almost all the chronicles establish a link between Vorus' execution and the murders of individuals he is said to have hanged to the tree near Mo, this elm, which bore his name, L'Arbre Vorus, or the, 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 the tree Vorus, or L'Orme Vorus, the elm Vorus, for this sinister reason, because he was executing people there. The identification of the victims varies in the different accounts. They were plowmen, laborers, English, Burgundian, or French, depending on the political uh, uh, obedience and social condition of the authors who write. Some portraits are more impassioned than others. The Batard de Vorus is depicted as most cruel and a tyrant by Thomas Elmam or the monk of Saint-Denis, who highlighted by contrast the innocence of the victim slaughtered for no reason. The most appalling and detailed account of the misdeeds of the Batard de Vorus is provided by the bourgeois de Paris, who tells the grim story of a pregnant woman whom Vorus ordered to be bound to a tree and left to the appetite of the wolves during a night of March 1420. 
this account, uh, this account uh, was dismissed by uh, Boris Bov, uh, who sees in this anecdote an exemplum horribilis, a stereotyped story fabricated. It was for him a product of a rumor and fear which was paraded for political purpose. I'm not entirely convinced by this interpretation. The story is very well detailed and dated, but it's true that it's unique. It's only one chronicler uh, talking about it. But maybe we should wonder that even if this anecdote had been fabricated, even if it was just a rumor, it aimed to be believed and indeed circulated. It was coached on paper in the journal of a clerk. It spread. We cannot exclude the hypothesis that Henry himself heard and believed this story as many others surely did. Uh, as opposed to the theory of both, which sees that this, uh, all these uh, criminal accounts put on uh, the charge against uh, Vorus were uh, a conspiracy against Vorus. So Henry V had committed to deliver the Vorus to the justice. Uh, two chroniclers claim that a trial took place, and it's, it is where it's more complicated to interpret, because this trial would have had a would have had to be particularly swift, done within three days of the bastard uh, surrender. The assumption of a summary execution on the English king's behest, as reported by several other chroniclers, seem more likely. This may come as a surprise. Henry purposely took the legal route in the case of Gaston Rouvre to reinforce his political stance. Why would he not take it for Vorus? Well, there is a, one possible explanation based on uh, Henry's belief that it belonged to God to punish the notorious monstrosity of Vorus and avenge the death of uh, his innocent victims. The, the idea of divine punishment, which was administered to Vorus, executed by where he had sinned, so hanged at the tree where he hanged his victims, is to be found in the chronicles of the monk of Saint-Denis and Jean Juvenal des Ursins. Henry V's taking the more moral high ground stood following this logic as the executioner of divine justice. So Vorus was stripped from the honors of the resistance, the execution and degradation of this nobleman in such a spectacular manner was anything but common and this is the reason why so many chroniclers dwelled upon it, to the point of relegating the execution of Gaston Hoof to the background. Henry V thus succeeded in making a striking example of the execution of this man, known by Hall for his heinous crimes. Conclusion. The situation of siege created special circumstances to which special rules applied, as Moriskin remarked. At Mo, a king faced social inferiors of humble origins. Rules, partly explicit, partly implicit, allowed combatants of unequal status to compete with each other, but they ignored this rule. Uh, uh, but the, the, these rules were ignored by the defenders of Mo, who breached the code of honor and incurred the wrath of Henry V. Negotiated surrender was an individual contract which created its own rules. The free disposal of the lives of those accepted from the agreement is one striking free to, a feature of these special rules. These contracts were not as formatted and standardized as one may believe. A careful examination of the clauses often reflects particular issues and gives an original insight into the mind of the two parties involved, especially the party which had the upper hand. The surrender of Mo reflects the will of Henry V. Wounded in his honor, Henry chose to punish. The punishment was measured. It, ta it targeted specific uh, individuals who were held responsible, responsible for specific issues. Medieval justice and repression work by the example. A well-chosen example, well-staged, can stand strong, a strong message. In choosing the legal path to condemn two chiefs, rebels, and royal officials, Henry discourages the, resist the resistance against him and publicly reasserts uh, his legitimate authority as regent and heir to the throne of, uh, uh, of France. The execution of Vorus sent a strong signal which happened to have a greater resonance in the chronicles. It showed Henry's sense of ethics and it was also a, a, a forceful demonstration to reassure the people suffering from the misconduct of the soldiery, uh, in particular in the Ile de France. We have a lot of examples at that point of uh, uh, complaints to Henry, uh, that Henry was showing that he cared. Finally, it showed that to the enemy that no one, not even a nobleman, could perpetrate crimes with impunity under his rule. Thank you very much.